HPPodcraft.com. Welcome back to the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Here at HPPodcraft.com, I am Chris Lackey. And I am Chad Pfeiffer. And we are continuing our coverage today of William Hope Hodgson's The House on the Borderland. And we are lucky enough to be joined by a guest, an old friend of ours, uh, coming at us from Sacramento, California. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Lopez. He's a librarian. I am a librarian. (laughs) You've been a librarian all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Right now I'm a librarian at Sacramento Public Library, but uh, I've been an arts and humanities librarian in academia for the Cal State universities. And I've worked in Mexico and libraries in LA and the Bay Area. Do you usually have your hair up and wear glasses when you work? (laughs) Oh, yeah. And then at night, you kind of take off, take off those glasses and let the hair go. Have you come across any dangerous or potentially maddening tomes in your uh, long time as a librarian? Well, yeah, you know, the great thing about being a librarian is you have sort of like your secret password to the uh, cemetery of forgotten books. What? You know, you get to see the uh, and touch the original papyrus editions of the Necronomicon and all that. I thought they were all fake. No, what are you talking about? Wow. You need to read the internet more. Yeah, I do. (laughs) Tell me about it. People have been writing into us on the internet this week since it's been the pork of July Mm -hmm. was what we introduced this month as. Because I was saying, you know, other than Return of the Jedi, are there any other pigs or pig creatures in movies or TV or anything Uh like that? And people are coming up with all kinds of interesting stuff. I mean, obviously we can't ignore the Muppets. Right. Miss Piggy. Which reminds me of another thing that people have been writing in about. (laughs) This legend of pig-faced women. Have you heard about this? Yes, I have. As a matter of fact, I was listening to a podcast called There's No Such Thing as Fish, which is there's a show here in the UK called QI, and Mm -hmm. it's kind of a quiz show, and they have comedians on, but it's not really a quiz show. It's just excuses to talk about interesting things. And uh, they brought up the the pig-faced women, but they didn't talk about the myth of the pig-faced woman, which you were telling me about. Yeah. Have you heard of this stuff before, Tony, the pig-faced women? Well, I listen to the pig-faced woman podcast, but <laughs> other than that, passing casual interest, no, no, not much. Okay. It originally was like a myth in the, uh, England and France in the late 1630s. There was a story about a wealthy woman whose body was normal, but she had the face of a pig. And this is because of some mm-hmm. kind of witchcraft. On her wedding day, the husband was going to be granted the choice of having her have the pig face for him and be beautiful for everybody else. Or everybody else sees her with a pig face and she's beautiful just for him. Which, I, you know, if you were had a fetish for Miss Piggy, wow, one of those choices would be awesome. You could have your, your pig face woman and then nobody would know. So you have a thing about Miss Piggy, Chad? Uh, you know, when I was a young guy, yeah, I thought she was cute. She knew karate. Anyhow, so uh, the husband gives the woman the choice. And she makes herself beautiful for him. But these stories, apparently, they lost that magical element, and it actually became a matter of urban legend. People would say that there were actual pig-faced women around. And that inspired hucksters to shave bears and dress them up like women and say, come see the pig-faced woman. (laughs) And if you go look at a shaved bear, it doesn't look anything like a pig, first of all. And second of all, it looks nothing like a woman. No, it looks like a werewolf. Yeah. I mean, normally when you shave an animal, it's kind of funny, but when you shave a bear, it's actually horrifying. (laughs) Poor creature. You know, speaking of werewolves and pig people, that's another place that pig people have shown up is in the movie American Werewolf in London. Oh, right. If you recall in the dream sequence, like they're like military pig guys or whatever that come in, shoot up the family. One glaring omission on the pig stuff, the orcs in Dungeons and Dragons. And I think it was in the uh, uh, Monster Manual. Um, you know, back in 78, I guess it was published somewhere around that time. The the orc illustration was, you know, had a definite pig it did. face to it. It did. You're right. I had remembered reading that Gary Gygax was influenced by the story House on the Borderland when he was creating some of the D&D material. Gary Gygax, in his famous Appendix N, in the, I believe it was in the Dungeon Master's Guide, mm-hmm. original Dungeon Master's Guide, he lists his influences, H.P. Lovecraft, and a lot of the weird fiction authors are in that uh, list. Lovecraft inspired everybody. I'm pretty much positive of that. <laughs> but a couple corrections uh, from last week's show. Okay. One yeah. of the things that I was really, I thought was important is that we said that they spoke Gaelic, but Gaelic isn't actually a language. Mm. Gaelic is like a, a family of languages. In Ireland, they speak Irish. Oh, okay. Some people were writing on our comments about Hodgson and Houdini. Oh, yeah, where he fastened him up so tough. Yeah, it was really cruel to him during his show. Yeah. But the reason why 
he was so cruel is because Houdini, he broke out of the Blackburn jail and made them mm-hmm. look bad. And so they were like, oh, that Houdini, he really made us look bad. We got to show him something. Hey, let's get Hodgson's over because he's really strong. We'll get him to, you know, get him. And we'll show Houdini for messing with the Blackburn police. Good to know that because we were kind of painting Hodgson to be a jerk. And there was reasoning behind I mean, he was asked specifically by the Blackburn police to do this, right? Like they came to him and yeah. said, try and make it tough for Houdini. Right. So real quick summary where we are, and then we can get into some of this new stuff. We're about to do the, the siege, right? That's mm-hmm. what we teased out last week. We've got an old man. He lives in a creepy house with his sister. He's gone on some trippy visits to another dimension where he saw this swine creature. Back in the real world, he is been hearing a bunch of them in the ravine behind his house, which he calls the pit. And one night he sees one of them peeking through the window of his study looking at him. So that gets us to chapter six, the swine things. It's a week after the incident of the sneaky pig, <laughs> which he's been kind of looking out for. He's a little nervous about the pig pig people because they seem dangerous. It's during the day. Oh, he lives with his sister, who's also his housekeeper. She's sewing in the garden. No big deal. And then there's this large sound, like kind of a big crash that comes up from the ravine and this big plume of smoke gets kicked up into the air. He says he thinks what it seems like is there was some kind of rock slide or cave-in of some kind. Yeah, he brings his gun with him because he's he's not sure what it could be. He's looking down in the pit and then he sees something. Then, as I stared, I saw something below to my left that moved. I looked intently toward it and presently made out another and then another. Three dim shapes that appeared to be climbing up the side of the pit. I could see them only indistinctly. Even as I stared and wondered, I heard a rattle of stone somewhere to my right. I glanced across, but could see nothing. I leant forward and peered over and down into the pit, just beneath where I stood, and saw no further than a hideous white swine face that had risen to within a couple of yards of my feet. Below it, I could make out several others. As the thing saw me, it gave a sudden uncouth squeal, which was answered from all parts of the pit. At that, a gust of horror and fear took me, and bending down, I discharged my gun right into its face. Straight away, the creature disappeared with a clatter of loose earth and stones. Bam! Turned into an action sequence suddenly. And this action sequence continues on for quite some time. Yeah. Well, he knows that all these pig guys are coming right after him, so he just hauls ass and heads back to the house, and he sees his sister coming to kind of see what was going on, and he yells at her, Run! Run for your life! Now, I want to point out, that can be read in two different ways. Mm-hmm, sure. It could be, run, run for your life, or run, run for your life. She's not seeing these creatures. He just comes hauling towards her with the gun saying, run, and she just picks up her skirts and does it, right? Yeah. So she doesn't even know what's chasing him. So she's running, and he is looking behind him, and he can see these pig men chasing after him. Yeah, and one of them gets really close and outruns its companions. It gets up to him and is trying to make a grab at him. So he takes his gun by the barrel, he turns around, he swings and he nails the creature in the head. Yeah, oh, man. Just drops with, with an almost human groan. So as he's running back to the house, he takes one out. He finally gets in and shuts the door. He shuts the door and locks it up and then he realizes, oh wait, I better make sure all the doors in the house are locked. So he runs around and kind of barricades all the doors. The ground floor has bars on all of the windows, really strong, sturdy bars as well. So he's not too worried about that. He gets back to his sister and he sees that she's just sort of freaking out and he touches her and she screams loudly. This is where we kind of realize we have an unreliable narrator. She doesn't say anything about the pig guys at all. Yeah. Because it seems like she didn't see them at all. But the way that he's talking about her, it's as if... Her nerves are shattered because of the the attack of the pigmen, but she hasn't seen any pigmen as far as we can tell. And the pigmen are trying to get in the house even now. He can hear them scratching at the doors and feeling around for means of ingress. Whether she can hear that or not, it doesn't say. No. Tony, do you think that this is actually happening? I think it is happening in the story. I think that the sister is definitely freaked out by her brother, but it is also possible that she's unhinged because somehow she feels something. I mean, the narrator describes seeing like weird glowing things and things like that. So he's experiencing stuff on an interior level Mm -hmm. or, you know, kind of strange phenomenon that he describes here and there throughout the narration. So there's nothing to indicate to us that the sister is or isn't also experiencing something, but she is there. So she may very well be experiencing some kind of supernatural Hmm. horror that the narrator can't tell us about because he's not privy to it. Possible. 
Now, in that comic book adaptation, didn't something else terrible happen? To the oh, my sister? God. Yeah. Well, the pig guys end up raping her, basically. What is that about? I was reading a review of, of that book, and the adapter feels that what the whole thing is about is about this guy, supposedly. This is, this is a reviewer mm. saying this, not necessarily the, the guy that adapted the story or the artist. But that the fact that this dude and his sister went off in the boonies to live together was some kind of hint that there was some kind of weird relationship going on. And that later on, when he gets visions of his lost love, that his lost love is actually not somebody else, it's his sister. Oh, whoa. So he takes that viewpoint and then makes it about that stuff. I think that that's not in here at all. I think that's totally something that they <laughs> put in. I don't even see a hint of it anywhere. No, I didn't get an incest vibe, but I can see how, because this was like Richard Corbin, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can see how Richard Corbin or Trulé also did a Hodgson piece. And so he was also from that early heavy metal right. group. For them, they made everything have a little bit of sexuality to it, some perversion to it, weird darkness, mm -hmm. you know, kind of strange vibes to it. So, I mean, it seems kind of like right in how they would do something. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's almost what I would expect them to do with that story. But I, I feel like that that's completely on them and that's not a subtext that's in the story at all. Uh, that's just them being a bunch of pervs. <laughs> that's what I think too. All right, good. And he talks to his sister and he leaves her alone up in a room. Not much happens here, but what he's doing at this point is just fortifying all of the doors. Mm -hmm. He can hear the things squealing at each other and the way that they're doing it, it sounds like human speech. Yeah. Since it's glutinous and sticky, nevertheless conveying ideas. So they're planning out there. Yeah. Just horrifying. They're not just dumb monsters. They're trying to make a plan to get in. He has to do a survey of the whole house. He actually goes down into the cellars to make sure there's no means of ingress there. Right. As he's looking around with his light in the cellar, he sees one of the creatures looking in through the window. A bunch of other creatures come in behind it, and they're all just staring at him. It kind of puts a spell over him. He's, like, frozen with this. Mm -hmm. So much so that he's actually holding the lantern by the hot glass and not realizing he's burning his own hand as he's staring at them. Yeah. He kind of snaps out of it and angrily throws the lantern at the window and it crashes through the bars and I think set some of these guys on yeah. fire. Yeah, they get hot burning oil on them and they start screaming and wailing. <laughs> and then from there he makes his way up to one of the, the towers so he can see what's happening. He gets up to the tower with his gun and he's looking around for them and he, he can't see them anywhere. But then he hears noise and leans forward and he sees that they're prone up against the wall of the house. Like they're hiding there. Yeah. Way down. So he, you know, <laughs> pulls his, he points his gun right out of the window and he blasts at one of them. Yeah. There's a scream, the smoke clears, and it's, oh yeah, it's on its back, re writhing feebly. Then it gets quiet. So he's able to take him out with a gun. Yeah, he starts shooting him up, but then after that, they kind of hightail it out of there and hide in the underbrush, and then it's starting to get to be nighttime. But before chapter seven, the part where he hears a loud squeal in the direction of the pit, it was answered a hundred times from every part of the garden. Yeah, which makes it incredibly terrifying. It's not just a handful of swine dudes out there. There's a bunch. There's a lot of these things. It's like an army. So, I mean, again, this feels like an action movie to me. Yeah, absolutely. The stakes just keep getting raised. You know, first it's it was one pig guy, now and it's like a couple, and now it's an army of pig dudes, and it's one guy with yeah. a couple of guns and his crazy sister barricaded into a house. <laughs> and his, his, his sick dog. Man, what's going to happen? This is. I mean, I got to say, I was pretty engaged at this point in the story. Definitely. Chapter 7 is called The Attack. So he's fortifying. He's trying to strengthen the study door with big pieces of timber. And then it's quiet for a while. And suddenly he hears a grunt and the, whole, the door creaks under this tremendous pressure. He says it would have burst inward, but for the supports I had placed. Yeah. So these guys are trying to get in. But fortunately, the struts hold... The creatures outside, you could hear them kind of grunting, talking while they're outside, and they decide they're going to try again, but there's more of them that show up. So there's like a whole group of them that are pushing on this door. So at this point, he's like, I'm yeah. not going to, I don't think the door's going to hold. I've got to go up there and deal with yeah. it. So he scurries up to the tower to get, kind of get an advantage to shoot down at the door, and he leans over, he fires, he shoots one of them. But then as he's kind of leaning over, this huge piece of stone from the building slips out from underneath his feet, and it goes crashing down, lands on one of the pig guys and, and smashes him, but also kind of blocks the door as well. The terrible thing here that happens, though, is the thing that gets crushed under the stone. Another pig guy All comes right. up to the stone oh. and silently bends down. It says, I was unable to see what it did. 
In a minute, it stood up. It had something in its talons, which it put to its mouth and tore at. Uh, so it's eating. They are, they're eating each other, right? The dead guy. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, that's how I got it. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I assumed that. So what it was, but then in, since he doesn't explain it in my head, I was kind of wondering, well, what else could it be? So then my imagination kind of takes over and I start thinking of all the sick things that I can imagine. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's why he writes it that way, I think. Yeah, that, I think that's a I think that's a skilled way for the narrator to go about it, to let you as the reader become an accomplice to whatever kind of horrors occur. Absolutely. Now, he's so disgusted by what this thing is doing, he shoots it. Yeah. <laughs> he shoots the cannibal pig, which it falls and kicks and then stops moving. But then he hears breaking glass inside the house so he's got to get off the roof and he's got to go down and deal with that so it's that kind of whack-a-mole thing that's going on right now there's so many of them trying to get in as he gets down into the house he sees one right even as he comes in there crawling into the room going through the window he blasts it this was interesting chris it might support Mm -hmm. your theory well there's a couple of things here he shoots the thing and then the smoke clears and the room's just empty and the window's gone so there's no body Mm -hmm. so did the thing just disappear or did it jump out the window I don't know did it exist at all again I don't think so and there's more evidence to support that later in the story although there are things physically happening to the house like the the glass in the window broke yeah the doors are being scraped up and scratched up yeah but I guess he's the only one who sees that right exactly (laughs) I just think we've got another case of unreliable narrator here. There's a few things that make me think that as we progress, I will point them out. But it could be possible. Tony's idea here that maybe his sister is experiencing some other thing. Mm -hmm. Like she's privy to something that he's not seeing, that she's got a completely different take on it. Like maybe he's somehow tapping into dimension X and she's tapped into dimension Y. But they're both having these kind of crazy experiences which is possible sure she could have her own thing going yeah totally if they are supernatural creatures then they don't have to obey the same physical laws the body's not there anymore or something along those lines that may just affirm their supernatural character yeah that's true rather than supporting the idea that oh he's just mad they could be just fading away video game style when they get killed. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's important too. There are footnotes or yes. endnotes, I should say. There were endnotes in the, the way this. I would recommend reading those because that's Hodgson. It's his take on some some of this stuff. So it gives you a little bit more insight onto maybe what he intended. Uh, these some of these pig guys are doing themselves. The one that window that he just shot at there's another one climbing on it now he he didn't go all the way downstairs he's in the house but he's on a higher floor yeah and the window frame gives way and that guy crashes to the ground and then he looks down and he's like i can't how are these guys getting up here the wall's really smooth the distance it says must be 80 feet and they're climbing all the way up to that window he can't figure out why and then he realizes oh there's a pipe here i got a pipe and some of the guys are on it right now climbing up and so he uses his rifle as like a crowbar and pries it off and knocks it down and they all go down with it. It's Again, it's really cinematic. Total action movie stuff here. The main door that they were busting into, the one that he dropped the rock on, he decides he's going to go down and try and take care of that. And he gets down and he sees the door has been pushed in about six inches. So like there's a six inch crack in the door. Mm-hmm. So he's like, thank God I was able to stop these guys when I did because they were just about to to get in and once they were in there's no way I would have been able to stop them so he sets to repairing the door as fast as he can and I think something you know the last few successful shots he's had and how he's managed to take a few of them out it scared them enough that they're starting to retreat yeah possibly that gets us into chapter 8 which is called After the Attack and now it's about 3 a.m. And it says the eastern sky began to pale with the coming of dawn. That's a little early for dawn, isn't it? In the UK, at at summertime, depending on how far up north you are, the sky starts to get light. I would say, yeah, about 3 a.m. And the sun comes up sometimes around 4.30. But Tony, you were trying to puzzle out the the series of events in this book. So does does that sound right? Is it around summer now? I think so. I'm guessing that it's sometime around the summer solstice, just because uh, he starts off by saying that the manuscript, you know, the narrator says his manuscript starts on January 21st. Then he says some months after my vision, and he goes into in chapter five and chapter six, he says it was evening a week later. At this point, we're right there in the middle of summer and the solstice, and it's the longest days of the year. 
Yeah. Well, so he stays up all night to make sure no more pig guys attack. When the when the light does come up, he wants to go check things out around the gardens to see because obviously there's going to be bodies. Well, you'd think, but there aren't. Even under the fallen stone where that thing was crushed, there's no body. Not even uh, not not a body. No evidence. Like no blood, no guts, no anything. Yeah. Again, now this made me think. Okay, he was. This has been in his head. But I think it's also possible that Tony might be right on this, that it could just be these creatures are not of this world. And so when they die, they maybe somehow go back to this other place and the remnants also go back to this other place. Or they're just really responsible, clean creatures. Yeah. That could be too. You know, they didn't want to leave a mess. Really tidy. So he kind of makes the assumption that, that they do actually, that that's what happened, that they take their dead and they just really thorough about it. Mm-hmm. He decides he's... It's time for him to rest. He's been up all night. It's been really stressful. And he sleeps for 11 hours. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I don't blame him. That's a, that's a lot to deal with. But what wakes him is he hears somebody creeping past his bedroom door. And he thinks, oh, crap, the pig guy's got inside. I'm screwed. But then he realizes, oh, wait, no, that's my sister. But why is she sneaking? Why is she being creepy in, my, in our house? That's weird. And he hears her going down stairs to the door and she's going to open it and he flips out he Mm. grabs her and says what are you doing they're out there this is dangerous you can't go outside and she just looks at him terrified and doesn't say anything she's sobbing she's crying she's freaking out and then he just says okay fine and that's when he picks her up and takes her up to her room and locks her inside the the way he describes what he says to her he's warning her you know we got to be rational don't put ourselves in danger there's not too much to be afraid of now but you know we got to be sensible and just not leave the house. He doesn't tell her why, though. No, he's still kind of holding on to that whole, uh, was it a wildcat? Is that what he said in the beginning? Yeah, well, it's he doesn't necessarily continue with that story, but later when he finds her tending to Pepper, she admits that she thinks that the wildcat's still prowling around. So yeah. that's the story that she's going with. And he says, well, if she's believing that, then I'm going to let her believe that. Like, her mind is fragile, and if that's the truth that she needs to cling to... <laughs> I'll let her do that. So he doesn't dissuade her from that. So one thing about Mary is that she's a caretaker. She cares for the dog. She cares for the narrator. But right now she's sort of incapacitated and he's having to take care of her. But it's this sort of tough love kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that this notion of these emotions run through this book. On one hand, there's the weird psychological kind of stuff. There's the supernatural stuff. There's the crazy space-time sequences. There's the action, Mm -hmm. you know, the swine creatures and this kind of stuff. But on the other hand, he's a sad old man. For some reason, has chosen to live in this place with his sister and his dog far away from anybody else. They don't communicate with anybody. And later on, we find out that there's only one person in town who brings them supplies the whole time they're there Mm -hmm. for 10 years. He's heartbroken from this lost love Mm -hmm. of his. We'll get into that later in the story, yeah. All of these emotions run through the whole story. His sister plays a big role as a caretaker here. Mm -hmm. But at this point, she's incapacitated. So he's kind of left to his own kind of extreme reaction to the whole situation where he feels he needs to take action and it's, you know, he's always grabbing a gun and he describes the guns, you know, it's like, oh, this time I grabbed this gun. He seems very dangerous. And and this is why I think she's afraid of him because he's running around. I mean, this is how I took it. He's running around with guns, shooting at stuff that she can't see and (laughs) <laughs> Basic, it seems to me like keeping her captive in their own house. Part of the thing that she's reacting to is that there's this menace coming and she doesn't even know what it is. Maybe suspects that he's just going crazy. Mm. But even if he did tell her the truth, it would be equally horrifying if he was ranting about pig men. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. so she, she's just not sure how to deal with him right now, especially when he's in this frantic state. He stays up all night in the tower waiting to see if the pig men are going to come back and they never no. do. So that that's the end of after the attack. And that goes into the ninth chapter in the cellars. He decides that he's got to explore every last inch of the house. Mm -hmm. And it's so big and it's just them out there that there are actually regions of it that he has never been in. Uh, So he has to make sure that they're all secure from the outside. So he goes down. There's a huge cellar down there. He goes to check it out. Just one of those big Lovecraftian. There should be essential salts and stuff down there. Big place. (laughs) You know, like it's a really big arching ceiling cellar. It's not just a little dank place. But when he's walking around, he kicks something and he kicks and looks down on the ground and it's a metal ring 
that's attached to a large door. It's a trap door. Yeah, never a good thing when there's a trap door in the cellar. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're already underground. But he, he reaches for a candle. He pulls the door open, and he looks down into the hole, but he can't really see anything. I was puzzled and surprised. There were no signs of steps, nor even the appearance of there ever having been any. Nothing save an empty blackness. I might have been looking down into a bottomless, sideless well. Then, even as I stared full of perplexity, I seemed to hear far down as though from untold depths a faint whisper of sound. I bent my head quickly more into the opening and listened intently. It may have been fancy, but I could have sworn to hearing a soft titter that grew into a hideous chuckling, faint and distant. Startled, I leapt backward, letting the trap fall with a hollow clang that filled the place with echoes. Even then, I seemed to hear that mocking, suggestive laughter. But this I knew must be my imagination. So when you were reading at this point in the story, what were you thinking? I was thinking that uh, these things were going to attack from that trap door. This was like a portal into some underworld or something like mm-hmm. that. And the reason I thought that is because just before he finds the trap door, he sees the strange, fantastic carvings. Right. He says he's in the cellar and he says, I observed strange, fantastic carvings which threw queer shadows under the light of my candle. To me, this was like a very Lovecraft kind of a thing as well, yeah. and you know, where you have like the you know the relief and the stone of well, he doesn't describe what it is, but yeah, you know, I'm just kind of imagining. And then when he finds the trap door with the sinister laughing and all of that, I'm thinking this is a portal into some other world. These supernatural creatures are going to come up into the house through it. Or is it literally a portal down to a subterranean world that lies under that pit or is accessed by that pit? Because as we go on here soon, we're gonna f- he finds a tunnel that, in the side of the pit that seems to go into some sort of subterranean place. Yeah, at this point, I didn't really think it was necessarily supernatural or interdimensional. I thought that he was going insane and that, that this maybe these things weren't necessarily real. And I think that's what's good about weird fiction is when it rides that line and you're not sure if something's real or something is just part of an imagination or part of a delusion that this might represent something or maybe the pig the pig creatures represent some part of him maybe he's got some repressed passions of some kind or some violence <sighs> and these things were these pig creatures were representing that uh, these mm. these were thoughts that were going through my mind at this point in the story well I- I wondered, too, is it something that he brought back from this other dimension with him? You know, because they don't start attacking or manifesting until he's made this trip through space and time to see his own house in this other dimension. Right. And that's where he saw one of these things the first time. And then when he came back, suddenly they're around as well. But, the, you know, his initial journey seemed really unprompted. It just kind of happened. Yeah, it did. It just happened. So uh, that's that seems really strange to me that there was no event that sort of triggered that journey into this other dimension. So not an event that triggers it, but he lives in this house and he's lived there for 10 years, Mm -hmm. which may seem like a relatively long time to us, but on the cosmic scale of things, which is what I think we're dealing with in terms of space and time, the way he, the way the narrator describes his experience, 10 years isn't a long amount of time. He is living in a house that was rumored to have been built by the devil. And <laughs> and it is a pretty odd house the way he describes it. It's a place of supernatural power. And it's something supernatural and powerful is bound to happen there sooner or later. This is when it happens. I just thought maybe, and maybe I'm trying to put reason on something that is inherently unreasonable, you know, mm-hmm. but I was just thinking maybe it was he drifted somehow into the other dimension where that house is. And the pig guys were rooting around that house like they live there. It's their pad, you know, so they saw him. He saw them. Now they're aware of each other. He crossed into their realm and then they come over into his. And it's all because of that initial contact. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a possibility. But with this story, you don't really ever get any concrete answers. In the next chapter, The Time of Waiting, that's an apt title for the chapter because nothing happens at all. His <laughs> sister is getting a little more calm. <laughs> yeah, It's clear that she thinks he might be nuts in this one phrase here. He, he, he says, come, Mary, cheer up. Things look brighter. I've seen none of the creatures since yesterday morning, early. And then it says she looked at me in a curiously puzzled manner as though not comprehending then intelligence swept into her eyes and fear but she said nothing 
beyond an un- unintelligible murmur of acquiescence. So there, it makes me feel like she's like creatures. Yeah. Oh, you're nuts. Yeah. That's what happened in her head to me. Yeah, me too. That's where I'm at. But I, you know, there's room for interpretation. I think. Well, he says it's. I didn't reference the swine things anymore because it was more than her shaken nerves could bear. Like he's missing why it's upsetting. Right. Her, you know. It's not because she's scared of them. Yeah, and to me, that's what makes him an interesting, unreliable narrator. I mean, I keep thinking of how in Chambers, The Repair of Reputations, how that guy was making all these mm-hmm. crazy assumptions as well at people's behavior. We knew that he was not of a right mind. So you have to kind of, it's a really cool idea to put that filter on between the reader and what's actually happening. And it gives you more room to wonder. Yeah kind of obfuscates things a little bit more in a, in a neat way. So you're trying to get through this filter and understand what you're really getting. This story is super great, and, and I was absolutely loving it to this point. I was riveted. We should bring it to a close. In the in this this chapter, The Time of Waiting, really, that's a, it says the fourth, fifth, sixth days went by quietly without making any attempt to leave the house. He's just stayed inside. He's barricaded in, but the swine things are gone, and they're, they don't seem to be coming back. Yeah. So that's what that. The, the messages in that chapter and then the next uh, chapter is called the searching of the gardens and he's going to actually go out do a search of the gardens look in the pit see if any of these things are still around so that's how we're going to kick off next time I yep think. I think that's a, a good place to pick it up Tony I loved having you as part of this conversation would you be available next week maybe to join us again well um, I'd love to alright perfect we'll be back next week with more House on the Borderlands and it's just going to get crazier it's going to get really crazy so put on your crazy socks <laughs> That's all we have for this week. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Chris Lackey. I'm Tony Lopez. And you've been listening to the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. HPPodcraft.com. HPPodcraft.com. Ah!